All right, welcome back. So we just got done um, going over graded potentials and action potentials. So now what we're gonna talk about is once those action potentials are initiated at that initial segment of the axon, what happens, where do they go? How do they get transmitted down to the rest of the axon? So this is what we call propagation. Um, there's two types of propagation we call continuous and saltatory. And then I'll also talk about what happens at the synapse. So what's happening when that action potential arrives at those telodendry and synaptic knobs to release the acetylcholine into the synapse um, of the postsynaptic cell. So again, things that we've covered already. So resting potential, grade potentials, action potentials. So three of these five processes we've covered. We're going to trigger or kind of talk more about this action potential that's traveling down the axon and then synaptic activity will be also in this video. And our last video will kind of putting all kind of the, res the response of this neuron communication in our last video of information processing. So let's take a look at our continuous propagation. So this is your initial segment, the action potential. I'm just going to start kind of like with a lightning bolt here. It starts at that initial segment. The whole video that we just did on action potentials, imagine that happening right there. Okay, so also you need to remember voltage-gated channels are found along the entire axolemma of the axon, telodendria, and synaptic knobs. So that little action potential graph I could draw kind of right here. So that's happening at initial segment, at the segment number one, okay? Now remember this action potential, sodium's gonna rush in, open those ion channels, do the whole action potential thing at that one little section, but know that there's no walls to separate. It's a continuous membrane, it's continuous cytoplasm. So all of those sodium ions that are flooding in during the action potential set up a graded potential to the next neighboring area of that axolemma, which is gonna bring that segment two to threshold. Once that segment is brought to threshold, its sodium channels are going to open, sodium is gonna rush in, and now this second area is gonna be doing its little action potential. In the meantime, segment one, that initial segment, is in its repolarization and refractory period. So we can't go backwards. There's no moving the action potential in the reverse direction because those sodium gates are inactivated, right? So they close at positive 30. They close and are inactivated all the way until it gets back down to around negative 60. But by that time, this signal is well on its way down the rest of the, the membrane. And so it's kind of like an action potential, like a depolarization wave. And then right behind, it's going to be a repolarization wave, getting the membrane back to rest in case another action potential is going to come down the line. Okay. So then we're going to see all of this sodium is going to come and depolarize the very next segment. And so then segment three is going to go through its little action potential. And then this is back to rest. This is in refractory. And this is in action potential. So the entire, we're going to have an action potential here, which will trigger an action potential here, which will trigger an action potential here, which will trigger an action potential here, and so forth and so forth, do, 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 all the way down the line until we get to the synaptic knob. So every single surface of the axon is depolarized, followed by a wave of repolarization, refractory period, until it gets back to rest, because sodium potassium pumps are doing their, their job. Continuous propagation is actually slower than saltatory, which is what we'll talk about next. So saltatory, saltatory means jumping. So when this was first identified, they're like, hey, the activity of the, of the action potential seem to jump down this axon. And if you'll notice, the axon isn't completely bare. It's got those Schwann cells or oligodendrocytes. They don't really identify, but there's myelin there those myelin sheaths. So here they're calling it a Schwann cell, but it could be either one. So when you have a myelinated axon, so if here's going to be my axon and I put some Schwann cells on there, there are little gaps, okay, right here that are exposed to the environment, right? So here's our initial segment, here's node one, node two, node three, and these are called nodes. Um, Node of Ranvier is kind of an older term, 
So these exposed nodes, this is the only place where you're going to have um, your voltage gated channels. So it's the only place where you can have the actual events of an action potential. So sodium rushing in, depolarizing, potassium rushing out, repolarizing, everywhere on, in between. So all the membrane that's underneath the Schwann cells does not repolarize or depolarize and repolarize. They're kind of insulated from that, those events. But the ions can still travel through the cytoplasm to depolarize the very next exposed node. And that's the jumping part of saltatory propagation. So let's take a look at step one. We would have um, initial segments, graded potential, triggered an action potential. So here, here's our little action potential doing its thing. These sodium ions then will flow kind of underneath the insulated internode to depolarize the very next segment. And it's like instantaneous. So it's way faster for this current to bring those sodium ions, this kind of local current, underneath or within the cell, underneath that internode to that next node, that exposed surface, than it would be to actually do an action potential um, at every surface of the axon. Okay, so now this little segment is going to be doing its action potential. And then it's going to trigger a local current, which will then trigger this little segment to do its action potential and so forth and so on. And then we'll do the refractory period um, behind. So we get an action potential here, we get an action potential here, we get an action potential here, we get an action potential here. So it's jumping from action potential to action potential to action potential. And that arrival of the action potential to the synaptic terminals happens way faster than it does in a continuous propagation. So with that being said, the, the difference between continuous and saltatory What's the reason for having two different speeds of action potentials? Well, it depends on the kind of stimulus. What kind of signal are you sending? So in your notes, there's different types of fibers, okay? type A, type B, and type C fibers. Type A fibers are going to carry the signals the fastest. So we're talking almost 300 miles per hour if we want to put it at a rate or a scale that we are familiar with. So that's really fast in a car. Imagine how fast that's going to be on a microscopic scale. So 268 miles per hour. These are going to carry information that's really vital for your survival. So that's going to be sensory information about position, right? So we don't fall over. Balance. Delicate touch, right? So as we're touching things with our light touch sensors, that information has to be processed very quickly. Pressure. So light touch and pressure to the CNS and then your somatic motor. So all of your conscious thought and control to your skeletal muscles travels along these type A fibers. They're large in diameter and they're myelinated, okay? The type B fibers are smaller in diameter, but they're still myelinated. So they slow down quite a bit. They're going cruising around 40 miles per hour if we're using that scale um, and that unit. And then type C fibers are the smallest in diameter and they are unmyelinated. So they're going to be carrying information about two miles per hour. So there's a huge difference, a hundred times magnitude difference between the speed of a large myelinated axon versus a small diameter unmyelinated axon. Okay, so some of the information that's carried along these B and C, kind of these slower fibers are gonna be sensory information about temperature, pain, general touch and pressure, visceral motor to smooth. So to the, the signal to tell your stomach to churn is not 300 miles per hour. It's probably 40 miles per hour. Your cardiac muscle glands and other peripheral effectors. So your skeletal muscle, delicate touch, and what was it? Balance, those types of things are gonna be traveling along the type A fibers. The less critical, I don't wanna say that, um, they're all critical, but the, the time sensitive, less time sensitive signals can be carried along the type, the slower B and C fibers, okay? All right, the next couple of slides, we're gonna take a look at what happens once this action potential reaches the synapse, right? So here we are, um, we've covered all of these things. So now we're gonna be at the synaptic activity. And you may, it may seem familiar to you because it's almost exactly of what we saw in the neuromuscular junction. So here comes our action potential, right? So our um, 
flipping of charges, our transmembrane potential is going from a negative rest, uh, negative 70 resting all the way up to positive 30, back down to negative 70. And the arrival of that action potential causes calcium, voltage-gated calcium channels to open. Calcium floods into that synaptic terminal. It is the arrival of calcium, in this case, that causes exocytosis of those vesicles. Where if you remember in the muscle, the arrival of calcium um, allowed the muscle to contract. So calcium is a really important second messenger, if you will, um, in cell response to things. So voltage-gated calcium, voltage calcium channels open, calcium runs, floods in, exocytosis of your neurotransmitter, in this case acetylcholine, binds the chemically gated channels on the cell body and dendrites only, causes them to open, sodium rushes in, and we get a graded potential, right? So we just get a graded potential. If it is next to, if this is your first section, the initial segment of the axon, yeah, then that graded potential is going to trigger an action potential. But if it's way far away, so say if we have this graded potential over here, there's no way that's going to impact the initial segment here. So it could just depolarize for a little bit and repolarize and, and be done. Okay. Now in, um, so here, if the, in this case, the action potential was generated. Then coming in behind the release of the acetylcholine is acetylcholine esterase. Again, we've seen that before. It comes in, it recycles the acetylcholine, removes it out of the receptor site, the gates close, and the signal is done because it's off and running or not, right? And then the last slide is just a closer up view of that process of the action potential showing up, calcium ions flooding in, exocytosis of your ACH, binding to the receptor, sodium rushes in, and then here's more details of that recycling of the acetylcholine. It, get bro it gets broken down into the acetyl-CoA um, or acetyl-CoA, right? So from our cellular respiration discussion, that might sound familiar to you. So that we get the acetyl group from acetylcholine from breaking down into acetyl-CoA and we get the choline from recycling it from the synapse. All right, so that is our propagation and synaptic activity. We have one more video to wrap up chapter 12, and that will be what happens at the postsynaptic cell, what we call information processing. All right, I'll see you next time. Bye.